Hello everybody, my name is Luke Marr and this is Hot Mode. and today on Hot Mode, we end our four part series about Fashion Month. Now we're going to be getting into Paris Fashion Week. I'm very excited. Paris Fashion Week ends out the whole Fashion Week cycle. And honestly, I think we need to discuss what went on in Paris. So before we get any further into the video, if you guys are looking for a channel that talks about fashion in the most fun, sassy, bitchy, analytical way, this is it. You can go down below, hit the subscribe button and turn on my post notifications. I mean, like, what do you have to lose? You're already here. And quarantining, hopefully. And if you guys want to see more from me, you can follow me on any of my social medias linked down below. And you can even check out the Fashion Victims podcast, a weekly podcast I do with my friend Darnell Jamal, where we talk about the fashion news and gossip you need to know. So let's get right into it and start with Paris Fashion Week. First up is Kenneth Ize. Kenneth Ize is a newcomer to the Women's Paris Fashion Week, but between showing impressive striped looks and having Naomi Campbell close his show, it's hard to not recognize there's something worth watching. Kenneth is a Nigerian designer who is based in Lagos and has become quite popular for his use of Asaoke fabric, which is historically done by the Yoruba people of West Africa. And with Africa becoming an important player in the fashion industry, it's not shocking to see designers like Ize and Tebe Magugu, who were both LVMH Prize finalists, although Magugu did win the 2019 LVMH Prize. Iman Hamam opened the show in a beautifully tailored skirt set with matching jacket in the Aso Oke fabric. Kenneth is known for his tailoring as he has become a force in the menswear world, but he realized many of his clients are women, so he wanted to stay true to his brand's roots. So you have this quite tight and straight skirt with a utilitarian pocket and slit, but matched with a quilted jacket in a similar stripe motif. His second look was another stripe set, but this time in contrasting colors, with the top a color colorful rainbow and the pants in red and black with a fringed hem. Ize will have to be careful when it comes to his color and pattern play as it can look more costumey than everyday wear. Next was a look where for the first time in the collection we got a solid color, which is smart for Ize to showcase as it's important for him to display that customers who buy his signature stripes can pair it with a range of pieces that are less bold. Also note his bags in those magnificent stripes with the matching fringe falling from them. They correlate directly with a brand signature and could easily be an Instagram hit. The quilted boiler suit worn by Adwa Aboa was gorgeous and it wasn't even symmetrical stripes. L listen to me, saying not even symmetrical stripes are good? That's how you know. The yellow and black stripe set with fringe on the hem of the coat and end of sleeves was gorgeous. Next were two color block stripe sets with red sections buttoned over portions of the pant legs. There also were stripe button downs, which I feel like could be a big hit with a menswear clientele who might be looking to spice up their more boring work and casual wear. Then we started to see knit sweater vests in green and purple, which morphed into different colorways of skirts and matching sets, which were chic. One t-shirt emerged with the phrase, Kenneth loves you. And while I know that was part of the marketing for the show, I think the phrase is a little tacky when embroidered on a shirt. It's not good when Calvin Klein does it, and I don't think it's gonna be any better when Kenneth Ize does it. Kenneth has the ability to create signature stripes that can be utilized by many different styles tribes as mentioned earlier. Preppy stripes on polos and button downs as well as the case of the t-shirt. Signature stripe styles that builds him a bit of a global cult following and could only be known by those in certain fashion circles which would eventually trickle down into the mainstream. But that will never happen with Kenneth Loves You embroidered over them. Men's and women's diamond motif suits that reflected in bronze, yellow, and white brought a traditional African silhouette about while a plaid dress with fringe strips started at the thigh. Finally, Naomi Campbell closed the show in a red, green, and black jacket coat with Ize's now signature fringe. This was a nice debut on such a big international stage, and I'm excited to see what happens for Kenneth next. Next up is Marine Sayre. Marine Sayre is Paris's top young brand, as her crescent moons and insightful and apocalyptic collections have been keeping fashion people on the edge of their seats for a few seasons. Also the masks she has been showing for seasons now, like I need to know who her trend forecaster is. They might need a raise. Unfortunately, this season, Sayre was a bit too Edgy? No, not edgy, just weird. And there wasn't too much to tie the collection together to form a coherent thought. The show opened with a lace structured, exaggerated hip velvet sleeve gown. Sayre is one to use up recycled fabric, but the look isn't particularly interesting. Next was a 3M crescent moon top with a white lace skirt. There was a face mask with floral eye holes and a strange asymmetrical fringe shawl. And then there's a t-shirt dress, which is not like the t-shirt dresses you are used 
used to. Sayer in her upcycling frenzy has created a new style for the t-shirt dress, where the upper part of the t-shirt is used, but the layers of other more light and flowy fabrics are layered on top to create a fitted top and flowing bodice. She followed the silhouette with one of her fully sleeved velvet tops and a white flowy lace dress over top. Then a black and white lizard printed look emerged with a moiré fanny pack that cinched the waist and a glitter breathing mask. The masks are ARPER masks that are used to filter pollution, but in the wake of the virus, Marine Sayre has certainly got her customers prepared, at least somewhat. Three houndstooth coat looks appeared, which utilized juxtaposed and blown up houndstooth checks to contour certain parts of the chest and sleeves. It seems like houndstooth manipulation is in. Sayre is brilliant at branding and has made the crescent moon print a gigantic part of her brand. We got a new style of it where a two-tone diamond was filled with the crescent moon. The looks where it was incorporated were gray and pink, and mostly they were suits with scarves that reminded me of extended draft stoppers. She then created a look from last season's equally apocalyptic collection with hooded moiré fabric and nylon fabric jackets for men and women. She then started to explore Fair Isle knits, which seemed to be an up-and-coming trend, though like other designers, she had a hard time making it look cool. She then started to show dyed denim with a yellow twinge mixed with floral upholstery-like fabric with fringe. Unfortunately, the yellow on the denim is not necessarily attractive, but the upholstery garments were quite chic, especially that dress with the crescent moon glove sleeve top underneath. The finale gowns weren't too great though as they were draped and constructed and just felt like a compilation of rags. While I love and respect the use of recycled fabrics, I think Sarah needs to work on construction as I think it would be a better way to reuse those fabrics. Unfortunately, this season from Sarah left me wanting a lot, 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 lot more and I hope to see that soon. Then there was Dior, the bane of my existence since Maria Grazia Curie ascended to the brand, and another unnecessarily large 85 look collection that is truly disgraceful to the name of Christian Dior, and that's just another nail in the coffin from Maria Grazia. There's a lot of nails in that coffin. This season, Maria Grazia continued to look to feminism as a reference point, and while I stan feminism wholeheartedly, Maria Grazia using it to sell shitty t-shirts and sweaters feels misguided. Ruth Bell, the model who opens every show to her own demise in my mind, emerged in a black knit bar jacket and ribbed moto pants. I guess Maria Grazzi is tapping into the very lucrative motorcycle girl gang market. The fitted boiler suit, bandana, and ballet flats combo really shows how much she knows about motorcycle girl gangs though. Then we get another take on the iconic Dior bar suit, although here the suit jacket is quite slim and less about a pronounced waist, and it's paired with a pleated chiffon skirt and black lace up combat boots. It's almost like you've seen this look in every every other collection. She proceeded to then address the pieces that you could find already in just about every fast fashion retailer. Plaids, branded underwear sets paired with slinky sexy net sheer dresses, and bigger boy hats. Maria Grazia continued to explore her Calvin Klein underwear set knockoffs, pairing them with sheer tops and fringe. We get a literal Zara plaid coat. I just have to say, if you are copying Zara, we have a problem, a really serious problem. We then got gingham and denim vest sets till Maria Grazia Curie's signature slogan t-shirts arrived with messages like, I say I, amongst others covered by blazers. And this is where my issue with Maria Grazia's faux feminism comes in. Firstly, you don't find a plus size model nor openly trans model on this runway. And well, where is the intersectionality in Maria Grazia's feminism? Then there was just more plaid, fringe, and leather pieces, but it continues to show that Maria Grazia's success at Dior is not because she is pushing her customer out of their comfort zone. Instead, she allows them to stay stagnant in their stylings, unlike Monsieur Christian Dior and the other creative directors that followed him by creating imaginative clothing that women wanted to wear. For the rest of the collection, Maria Grazia addressed fringe even more, which proves my point that Maria Grazia's haute couture for Dior is truly nothing different than the brand's ready-to-wear, which is a crying shame. She finished the show with this vile fringe and embellished net concoction, and well, Dior is still dead while she reigns with a very, 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 very ugly iron fist. 
Next up is Saint Laurent. I'm not the biggest fan of Anthony Vaccarello's Saint Laurent. It was promising at the beginning, but he's slowly become a gimmicky designer who lets his sets and model choices overtake the clothing, which is his real job. So like, why are you doing that? That's okay. This season, Vaccarello explored latex, as it was in literally every single look from the 66 look collection. Now, while that is nice, it's not particularly innovative as Claire White Keller's Givenchy Haute Couture collection the skin tight latex has to be the reason the fabric has really become trendy again. On top of that, being a designer at the House of Saint Laurent means that you should be an innovator of clothing like Monsieur Saint Laurent. Vaccarello really isn't that though, as his collection was literally just latex added to 70s and 80s Saint Laurent styles that lack much design innovation or editing. Not Mr. Saint Laurent, but Anthony Vaccarello. That bitch can't even re-edit other people's shit. The show opened with two blazer looks outfitted with pussy bow blouses and black latex pants. Next was a cropped bodysuit corset that allows the breasts to be on display, but was covered by a large gray wool coat. The next look had a latex pussy bow blouse, which was really cool, I'll admit it. But a ruffled lace halter sheer top and latex pant was the last good look for a bit. In the same vein with Maria Grazia, there really isn't too much that was new from the collection, so I'm doing a quick rundown of the rest of it. It's like, these bitches are just stylists, honestly. Pastel blazers in blue and pink, latex dresses that didn't look like they fit too well, and a pair of purple latex pants with a yellow fur jacket was cute. There were colorful plaids mixed with latex pants and knee-high boots, a range of black latex dresses with ruffles and turtlenecks, lots of sheer tops and dresses to give it that Saint Laurent slinkiness, and more fur and lace bra tops, and some other furs too. The show finished with a red latex wrap dress with sharp shoulders in a 1980s style and black draped dress with waist cutouts that were semi-chic. Saint Laurent is so tired, so is Vaccarello, and so are the show gimmicks. So let's cut to the chase. We need Anthony Vaccarello to innovate or vacate. Next up is Margiela. John Galliano is one of fashion's most controversial figures due to his anti-Semitic tirade from when he was still the creative director of Dior's women's wear. But since his return to fashion with the help of fashion's old guard, no doubt, he has reinvigorated the house of Martin Margiela. John has recently looked to the reinvention of fabrics and reusing them in order to create create his pieces, which is very much so in line with Martin Margiela's deconstructionism ethos. The show opened with a tulle dress full of color, which Galliano was known for, but there was a one sleeve deconstructed collar and lapel with visible stitching, and the next look took the same approach, utilizing a chartreuse sleeve and orange and brown tulle dress. Also note the handbag with the plastic wrap hanging on it by a thread? No, a plastic palette in reality. Honestly, nowadays, the plastic plastic bag on your bag might be helpful. Then two monochromatic looks in red and military green had sewn on fabric cards that read Ricicla, which is Spanish for recycle. I was momentarily confused as I looked up the word for recycle in French or Dutch as Martin was from Belgium, but I soon remember that Galliano is Spanish by origin, so maybe Ricicla is him referencing his childhood growing up in a Spanish home? We then got one of the signature techniques from Margiela in dress form. The dress is made of chocolate velvet with what the Margiela team has been calling hand cut sequins. Many would just call them holes and dispose of the fabric straps that dangle from them, but Galliano leaves them, which contributes to their deconstructionism and they move so beautifully as well. He also started to incorporate animal skins with feathers on skirts, leather coats with contrast stitching and furs jumping out of cropped coats. Cutout tops took on new heights as they were layered with cardigans and sweaters whose colors peeped out from underneath. I realize these fur trim jackets have the hand cut sequins too, and these looks incorporated the new Margiela Tabby X Reebok collection. I'm interested in certain pairs, but the shoes do come with quite a bit of controversy. The Margiela team has been accused of copying by an artist who posted pictures that in reality look a lot like the Galliano Tabbies a lot earlier than they were released. Galliano proceeded to show menswear as well as utilizing more traditional masculine fabrics and silhouettes, but turning them on their heads with crazy stylings. We get two oversized coats, one with curved sleeves and the other with the lapels being tied to form a large bow. Something about this red and green monochrome situation must be to Galliano's liking as he explored these colors in looks five and six. The collection ended with a few deconstructed looks with colors being 
being combined with white as well as two dresses using the hand cut sequins in lilac and black. A bit of a more laid back outing for Galliano this season, no doubt, but even masters need breaks, no? Next up is Mugler. Casey Cadwallader's Mugler has really truly helped to reinvigorate the brand for a new set of fashion kids and give it a much more social media-esque revamp. And while Bella Hadid took the cake in more ways than one for last season's show, this season felt a bit deflated. The show started with a leather set with all over the tight fitted top and baggier pants. The tightness of the top was great and it looked like it fit the model like a glove, a leather glove to be exact, but the pants being so baggy threw off the rest of the look. Cadwallader will need to work harder to get a better handle on leathers if he wishes to continue these stylings. A large black coat emerged but the looks after were much more interesting. It wasn't the black jacket or bra top that caught my eye but the leather skirt which had a gigantic slit, Cadwallader's version has a leather strip that dipped down and attached to a sheer legging, connecting the two textiles. It's interesting to see how Cadwallader is building his own accessories that don't necessarily revolve around bags or shoes, which is usually what most luxury brands go for. But I wonder if these leggings would ever catch on in the mainstream. The seamed bodysuit in that athleisure sheer fabric was placed under a black shearling coat, which I believe is the first time Cadwallader is exploring exploring shearling for Mugler, and is juxtaposed against electric blue leather pants and shoes. We get an off the shoulder sleeved and stitch contoured dress in a nice brown, and I'd love to see Casey explore dresses like this more, especially for plus size models. We get another version of the cutout skirt with legging strap in brown, as well as a cutaway shearling coat that exposes the model's breasts while matching them with black oversized pants. A beautiful strict structured bolero that also exposes the breast through a pleated black sheer top made the construction the House of Mugler is known for a bit more wearable by adding a slick black pant and bone peplum under top to this look. I think Cadwallader would actually do really well by exploring the idea of modern corsetry through these athleisure and performance fabrics in a more exaggerated manner for a few looks each season as an ode to Thierry Mugler's theatrics and to give the rest of us something fun to look at. There were more daywear looks with a bit of boring styling till Deborah Shaw, the iconic model, broke out another one of those structured and open boleros that had a stitch girdle that rose up under black pants. A leather version of the bolero had a white stitched sheer top underneath and was matched with a black pair of leather pants. Jill Kordelev continued to demonstrate Cadillac's fascination with dressing models outside of the industry's standard twos, zeros, and double zeros. She adorned a black stitch dress with sheer sleeves that wound themselves into gloves and outlined the shoulders with a sheer skirt falling from the cocktail dress. I would like to see Cadillac push his evening wear, especially for plus size models. A bolero in animal print, shiny black corseted two piece, fully sheer dress with silver paillettes, debuted before the finale dresses. He showed sheer dresses with black shapes that curved around certain areas of the body, accentuating the breasts, waists, and legs. Those sheer dresses are absolutely breathtaking, as they let the skin's color naturally shine through and accentuate each model no matter their shade. But the beige skin color dress, which showed a difference between the model's shade at the neck, was less impressive and looked, well, cheap. Like Fashion Nova, that's not good. And a luxury brand should never show pieces that look like the brands that are in fact knocking off those luxury brands pieces. And honestly, Bella Hadid's finale look should have been switched with Nyauga Ruega's look. Cause here, Nyauga takes the fucking cake. I like Casey Cadillac, but this season, a uh, bit blah. But hoping he starts to get a bit exaggerated, cause it would be really fun to see. Next up is Paco Roban. Julian Dosena has created a renaissance at the House of Roban. And speaking of renaissance, this season definitely looked to history for inspiration. We started the collection off with a beautiful tailored black military style coat that was piped with embroidered flowers. For fall 2019, Dosena also explored this military style, and these coats were truly some of the best looks from the collection. Here, it's nice to see that a brand whose original source material is space age 1960s styles can actually execute such sharp and beautiful tailored looks. Next was a gray sheer top that had a red paillette skirt layered over top with a black leather turtleneck collar to finish it off. Don't really know if it worked, and by don't really know I mean I know it didn't work. 
But the black wool cape and skirt combo with white skirt underneath helped me forget it. After that, we moved on to one of the show-stopping pieces from the collection. In full chainmail regalia, a Paco Rabanne staple, a hooded bandana-like chainmail poncho, and full-length skirt adorned with metal fringe appear. Then came floral looks, one, a simple floral pattern piped with black lace in a fuller silhouette, and that fuller silhouette was blown away by the shiny psychedelic paisley. Another hooded poncho top arrives and truly starts to show that DeSena was inspired by medieval age dressing. The other interesting thing about the look is that the chainmail is in fact depicting prints of flowers, while still being trimmed with metal diamond-shaped fringe. Another chainmail dress, with the individual link looking like soda pop tabs, enshrouded the model's head and had the face and decolletage of the model covered in long oval paillettes. You can also tell that the dress is completely sheer as the space between the model's legs doesn't have a beige tint to it, which normally you'd be able to see if Docena had placed mesh fabric underneath there. A pink paillette poncho top with lace collar and lapels cover a white lace and pink paillette dress. Docena then explores more wear styles, which included a black leather jacket, lace and floral paillette printed dress, and a gray wool suit with white and green floral embroidery. Oh my god, that was so beautiful and obsessed with it. One psychedelic printed dress had just a bit too much going on that it hurt my eyes, and bandanas continued to be involved in looks as a yellow floral printed dress had asymmetrical square panels piped with fringe jumping off of it. Another chainmail in either gold or bronze, depending on your eyes, came in another bandana style, here covering the belly button but exposing the waist on the sides with another full-length skirt and hood with diamond paillettes. We got some more floral looks as well before another printed chainmail with gold fringe emerged. Docena then showed fur with hoods, another gold chainmail dress, a gray military coat with green embroidered and beige suede dress with chainmail cape. A black paillette top with a skirt and a floral top layered underneath had a chainmail bandana as well. Who knows, maybe Docena is trying to get customers comfortable with these bandanas in an attempt to expand the brand's accessories line for those unfamiliar with its history. A sheer chainmail top and skirt emerged as well as a chainmail dress with two diamond-like shapes that bring the eye to the waist. Finally, the lace that we had seen throughout the whole collection got a silver makeover and was paired with a chainmail skirt that gradiated into lace. All in all, a nice and dreamy collection from Docena that allowed him to continue breaking the stereotype that Paco Rabanne was only influential in the 60s, because honestly, Paco Rabanne is one of the only brands I truly care about at this point. Rick Owens. Rick Owens this season continued to explore what he had done for his menswear show, which was an exploration of David Bowie's wardrobe and the designers who dressed him like Kansai Yamamoto. The show opened with a one-shoulder gray wool dress with a crop top underneath that exposed a bit of rib on one side. Owens also unleashed these Kiss-inspired boots here in a gray pebble leather with an anime-like gray metal slab with visible bulk. What looks like the same dress and crop top combo followed with a jacket and clear plastic coat. The knee-high black leather boots with visible stitching were spectacular, while the metal toe cap detail continued to give me anime fantasy. Another one-shoulder dress appeared this time in black with a white bra that looked as if two of the same bra had been layered on top of each other. Between the coat from the last look and the bra from this one, maybe Owens is very into layering? A one-shoulder sheer plastic dress in the same cut as all the other previous ones was layered over a black one-shoulder catsuit. A white sharp shoulder coat in brown wool with, with a gray wool asymmetrical dress also emerged. The tighter the fit, the better for Owens as the white t-shirt with the black leather detailing and asymmetrical wool skirt was a mess. And the leopard boots, they truly didn't help. I did love the plastic look with sleeves that were TLTF, aka too long to function, and a matching pair of plastic thigh-high boots. A top with exaggerated shoulders that felt almost like protruding bones was magnificent and played with the proportions of the body, while the asymmetrical skirt fell in line with the rest of the collection. I'll call that style of shoulder the devil's shoulder silhouette, and it made another appearance in a cocktail dress form, paired with zip-up tricep length gloves and thigh high leather boots. The layering continued with a blue one sleeve dress with another sweater underneath, but the plastic skirt layered on top added that Rick Owens oomph 
A blue shearling coat got the layering treatment, while there was a puffer slash leather and separate shearling version of the devil's shoulder. The devil's shoulder style was shown in Leopard, and well, if you've ever seen Cell from Dragon Ball Z, you could see the resemblance. A blue glossy jacket was intended to make it look like it was made of large scales and was paired with crochet bulbous shouldered sleeves. I wouldn't say I loved it, and I really wouldn't say I loved the leopard and blue version either. Owens also explored puffer coats as well in blue and black, and a whole range of jackets with bulbous sleeves also merged with matching dresses underneath. I fell in love with a floor length cape in black puffer material with a chain holding it together. Honestly, it looks like the perfect accessory for hangover. Like just wear that around your house all day long, baby. The blue and silver styles of the cape were great because you can actually see the stitches underneath, which put the beautiful details on display. To end the show, Owens created women's wear versions of his Kansai Yamamoto dedicated pieces. Kansai was the first Japanese designer to show during London Fashion Week in 1971, which was a whole 10 years before Yoji Yamamoto and Rei Kawakubo showed in Paris and changed how Japanese designers were interpreted by the West. These looks, which consisted of bold silhouettes in black with what looked like tea stained lines running all through the looks. This was a reference back to Kansai's work as he made a bow legged vinyl black and white jumpsuit in these iconic photos by Masayoshi Tsukita. There is no vinyl on Rick's look, which I think was a great choice for reinterpreting the looks. And instead of circular leg shapes, they were quite rectangular and sharp in the cut of the jackets, coats, and dresses. All in all, Rick seems to let his menswear collections lead. And well, that sets a nice precedent for his women's wear collections. Next up is Off-White. Virgil Abloh is one of the most controversial figures in the fashion industry. Many have highlighted his lack of creativity, his helping to bring a rise of streetwear in high fashion, and the constant accusations of him copying young and smaller designers. This season, he opened the show with a disastrous black dress that was truly a hot mess. Not even Bella Hadid could save. Having amazing models that couldn't save the looks was a real trend at Off-White, as Maria Carla Boscano could do nothing to make a coat dress with large slit and ruffle detail not look ridiculous. I personally love cow print, but somehow Virgil made it sad and uninteresting. Except the sweater with frayed spots. She can stay. A black leather blazer with white spray paint spelled out what I believe is A-O-W. Virgil loves a bit of wordplay. Maybe they're usually more grammatical, but his quotation marks are signature to his brand. I can only assume that AOW stands for Ablo White Off, and maybe it's a reference to monograms on things like robes and bath towels. Seeing how, if you read it, it would say Ablo White Off. That's what I'm gonna call Virgil from now on. Ablo White Off. Which wouldn't make too much sense. A white clingy dress with massive cutout and gold chain belt is obviously a reference to the famed Gucci by Tom Ford white tight dress with cutout and gold chain worn by Carolyn Murphy for the fall 1996 collection. Now Virgil loves referencing other famed designers, but this was such a reference considering he asked Carolyn Murphy to walk his show and wear the dress. The next look was similar, but instead of a dress had a skirt with smaller hole, which was much more in line with the Gucci collection. Virgil loves an accordion pleat, so it wasn't shocking to see, but when Yolanda Hadid, mother of Bella Gigi and Anwar, as well as a cast member of The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, emerged in a white blazer with the AOW graffiti, I was was interested. Not in the clothes, just over the fact that Virgil got Yolanda out of retirement. I personally think Virgil was trying to shame Carly Kloss by making her wear this draped dress. It's the fall winter 2020 equivalent of a dunce hat. Maybe she could wear it to dinner with the Kushners? Virgil then tried to take on Houndstooth, and like many other designers this season, he didn't make it any more interesting, even if we swirled the print. Also, what's with the weird circle motif throughout the collection? Like, did he see Marie Grazia's Dior Haute Couture collection and say, wow, she's failing miserably let me copy that. I am truly disgusted by the camo pant and green pleated top monstrosity. I can't even talk about the navy looks and the splotchy prints are even worse. Virgil then mixed purple and navy with neon green which resulted in nothing revolutionary and a crop neon green Arteryx jacket matched with a white tulle skirt is a silhouette I don't mind seeing from Virgil but again we've seen it a bunch of times. Next was an asymmetrical nightmare with a long button down dress whose skirt was half cotton fabric while the other half looked like crinoline skirt. It just didn't make any sense. Plastic blue and silver looks followed. 
but Gigi Hadid tried to close the show in an asymmetrical Arteryx jacket and fully pleated dress, but you can't close something that was never really opened, now can you? Many called out the similarities between Virgil's work and a look from Claire White Keller's Givenchy Haute Couture collection, and well, it wouldn't be a stretch to assume such a thing. I'm tired of Off-White, and I think Virgil should appoint a young and cool designer to take over women's wear, because he is not doing a good job. Next up is Loewe. Jonathan Anderson's success at his eponymous label, JW Anderson, was spectacular this season, but it's hard for a designer to create two absolutely amazing collections for two different brands in just one season, and especially back to back. This season, Loewe didn't hit it out of the park, but it kept up the pace it needed to be JW Anderson's luxury sister. Anderson said he wanted to play with silhouette this season and the idea of dressing to impress. The show started with three of the same dresses in green, blue, and cream. The torso of all the dresses had a black bib with a spliced neckline but was contoured by green, blue, and cream printed fabric that looked like little wreaths. A dress in a blue printed fabric appeared with the same black bib but instead added the blue printed fabric across the bust, adding a tear that fell into the skirt of the dress. I mean, I'm a bit bored by the black navy and leather looks, but the prawn print printed ruffle dress in black and beige was interesting. While an evergreen coat with fur sleeves was reminiscent of the gigantic coats from his show in London. There was another coat in beige with silver fur which was gorgeous, but the orange silk dress in between the coats was a bit bored and cheap looking, especially for Loewe standards. Three beautiful brocade styles emerged which had a capelet style on top and buttons descending down the dress which revealed even more of the same fabric underneath. Jonathan did get a bit weird as he used a gold ball plate of some sort that scrunched the fabric at the torso, helping to skew the polka square print. I didn't get it at all. A pair of puffed up pants, almost like a blow up sumo suit, but made of khakis, was paired with a peplum sweater adorned with fringe on the collar and sleeves. The sweater was beautiful, but the pants were comical. There were bountiful dresses with strange prints like the prawn print making a reappearance, spiral circles, diamonds and circles, and more spirals, albeit a bit more fun. Anderson then showed two ridiculously oversized tracksuits, and to be very frank, they looked like they were pumped up with a Nair canister. Another peplum sweater with beautiful embroidery at the neck and sleeves in mint green worked perfectly with a navy blue oversized trouser. Then a spiral printed inner sleeve cutout jumpsuit emerged, a black version of the orange silk version too, it looked better in black though, as well as a white version of the black bib with fabric over bust dress. A beautiful white ribbed dress with tiers of ruffle encrusted with blue beads was stunning and should have beat out the black cutout sleeve suit for the finale look. All in all, J.W. Anderson was the better half of Anderson's creativity this season. But that doesn't mean Loewe was walking away empty-handed either. Balmain. Olivier Roustong has had a rough couple of seasons at Balmain recently, but that seemed to stop this season. Models emerged in a cluster of Navy military coats like a squadron before Leah Kedeby declared that the show had begun in the most magnificent leather bodice. The bodice looks similar to the beautiful marble statues like Pieta that expertly depict a drape in a material that isn't usually associated with draping. Here, the bodice is the center of its own masterpiece with knit turtleneck and skirt, as well as a flowing camel poncho piped with leather. It was a brilliant way to start the collection, and more poncho looks appeared in light beige, dusty rose, and white. A new belt was also on display. The buckle was large and similar to a keychain mechanism with the name Balmain engraved into it. Was it revolutionary? No. And neither was the quilted section with the jacket, poncho, and skirt. The 1980s, which is a constant reference point for Roustan, made an appearance through a shoulder padded ruffle skirt suit. A wrap leather skirt suit showed that the leather Olivier was working with could be quite malleable, but the next look, a stone cold gray casted leather corset with matching gloves over a pair of oversized khakis and gray boots was breathtaking as well. I pray that the Bellman customers like this concept. Even if they don't wear them much, they could be a timepiece for their bodies for their loved ones who might travel a lot. I mean, personally, I would pay for one if I could afford it to just do the casting drunk with all my girlfriends at the atelier. Like, that would be so much fun. It'd be like drunk painting with Balmain leather. The nine look print section was going for a Versace Barocco print 
effect. It looked more Zara though. A grey quilted look that was piped with leather and had a quilted fabric belt to cinch the waist was fantastic as well. Car interiors couture. Olivier's more casual looks are hard to get behind because who is going to wear those sweaters and denim looks and expect to not be recognized as an extra from a 1980s movie set. The military looks were blech as well but I didn't mind the crinkle wrinkle looks too much. I would like for Olivier's silk suit to work but the silk just looks tacky and maybe if they invested in a stiffer or less chintzy looking silk they could have a better outcome. A blue leather draped breastplate which was slightly covering a brown one underneath it and a glossy leather pant to finish it off. With each of these leather corsets, it's getting harder to not realize just how beautiful they are. Fashion also has a quite long history of the style of casting the female torso, starting with designers like YSL and moving through multiple houses throughout the decades. The collection took another wondrous turn when a chocolate brown latex suit dripped down the model's body. It was pulled at the center to create texture and also the gloves on the look did remind me of the period of time where everyone was making fun of Donald Trump for having baby hands. Although I have seen how you put them on, it seems a lot rougher than I would envision. There was a butterscotch version as well, which truly looked like liquid gold, and I pray the Bellman customers buy these looks. It went a bit downhill with the sequin section. The gigantic eruptions of fabric was just weird. A couple of 1980s styles in velvet materialized before two bright leather draped bodices in red and blue came out too. The rest of the collection was 1980s central, but had Olivier had more of a dramatic look as the finale, it would have pulled the collection together even more. Olivier created a lot this season, not all of it good, but when it was a moment, it was a moment! And those leather bodices and latex suits will live on for years to come. Next up is Balenciaga. Now that Dina Vasalia is working at Balenciaga full time, this quite thoughtful, albeit scary show was the perfect way for him to flex his creative storytelling and construction chops. I mean, the floor was covered in water, maybe alluding to the impending results of climate change and the first few rows, usually reserved for fashion's elite, were half drowned in the water. Maybe Dina was trying to say if we don't solve the issue there aren't going to be any front row seats to fight over. But maybe we should handle coronavirus first, no? The show began with 14 black looks all with a monastic vibe that was a bit eerie. The first was a velvet stiff turtleneck dress that covered everything except the hands and head. Cristobal Balenciaga, the founder of the house and master of silhouette, was a devout Catholic who had a strong faith and respect for the church. That that could explain the majestic menswear like these amazing floor length coats with gigantic sleeves and built-in cape. The next look was a bit confusing as the coat had an extra panel that wrapped itself around the head, but it might be helpful to know that Dimna was also inspired by the church, albeit a different one. He grew up in the Orthodox Church in Georgia and was always inspired by the styles of the priests. He was calling into question why no one in society bats an eyelash at religious men wearing quite feminine silhouettes, but when men not of the religious variety do it, it's a travesty to masculinity and the world. And honestly, it's a point to ponder, especially when Dimna was quoted as calling some of the religious clergy as the nastiest perverts. And with the Catholic Church coming under fire for its lack of protection of young and vulnerable people within its system, Dimna hit the nail on the head. Alec Weck's velvet turtleneck coat had a bit going on at the hips that exaggerated them, which was nice as it added a bit of volume that Cristobal was known for. Navy blue and fiery red looks emerged before a whole other slew of black looks emerged highlighting boxy shoulders and pleats. It was paused by a t-shirt with an arrow pointed upwards, a pair of jeans, and a thigh-high pair of waiter black leather boots. Maybe that's a reference to friend and collaborator Martine Rose, who also showed knee-high boots during her London Fashion Week men's collection. A few more black looks appeared, one being a very chic structured pair of black leather shorts, before a safety pin sweater and reflective plastic sweater showed up. Dimna then showed a 
spiked leather coat that almost seemed like a joke at first, but honestly, it's the perfect social distancing tool. I fell in love with the off the shoulder fur coat with dramatic collar as it was most definitely a reference back to Dimna's first Balenciaga collection, which helped to catapult him to fashion stardom. A range of quilted floral looks emerged, some of them looking a bit scary old lady who lives alone in a cottage at the end of the woods in a horror movie, but who am I to judge the Balenciaga customer's aesthetic? There were lots of moto styles for men and big coats in red leather, black fur, and black pleats. And then some very tight suits appeared in all different colors. I was just so amazed at the tightness as you could literally see the outlines of the breasts of the models as they were vacuum packed in between the rest of the body and the coat. The devil shoulder style also made an appearance in black, red with black florals, a blue trench coat, black denim, two knit sweaters, and floral cape looks as well. Then there were a slew of Valenciaga soccer or football looks. I guess Dimna is trying to find a new segment of the straight market. The sock seekers obviously were not enough. For women, there were draped spandex looks, while for men, there were spandex catsuits with visible stitches. One of the finale looks was in black sequin and another was in silver crystal, but again, a bit of a more dramatic finale would have been better. Dimna put out a nice collection. The message behind it was intriguing and poignant, and there were pieces that bolster that message as well. Not much more I can ask for. Next up is Valentina. Pierpaolo Pacioli's Valentina ready to wear collections never quite hold up to their older sister. The brand's haute couture collections, and it's just the truth. After Pierpaolo's latest couture triumph, a collection full of pieces and styles that we've all seen from Pierpaolo before wasn't really gonna cut it. Something to also note, the soundtrack for the show was almost all Billie Eilish, the American music wonderkind. But we didn't even get to see Pierpaolo's take on her signature oversized silhouette, which was disappointing to say the least. And like, I'm just gonna break that news to you at the beginning. Like I was expecting something good, never came. The show opened with 25 black looks that ranged from coats to dresses to tops and jackets. Too. Here's the thing you need to know about these looks. Jill Kordelev became the first plus size model on the Valentino runway in an albeit blah leather skirt and bustier top with wool coat. There was a beautiful rose petal jacket made of individual leather rose petals that created a beautiful texture. A men's look with sheer top was covered by a big wool coat. There were sheer dresses and tops, which I feel like we've seen so many times from Pier Paolo. And with the scallop hems and ruffles, it was even more painful. And the section finished out with a few leather looks and a sequin dress and wool cape and skirt. The color we know and love from Valentino, the signature Valentino Rosso or red, emerged with a dress and sequin turtleneck layered underneath on top of a classy red wool coat. The sequin fishnet dress was nice, but the shape of the bodysuit underneath wasn't so great. There were more reds with a leather coat, sheer ruffle dress, and caped dress with slit, which were all meh. There was a nice shaggy yarn coat that was the star of another black section, before two beige dresses emerged. Then we got into the garden party section of the collection that started with a sheer white dress with different colored laces, a floral embroidery coat with rose petal bag, which honestly is so beautiful and reminds me of a chic armadillo with straps. The screen printed florals on dresses, which are a pure Paolo classic showed up, as well as a few blah herringbone styles too. Anya Rubik had an interesting cape with floral motifs that looked like they had either been painted or encrusted onto the coat, while a whole slew of ghostly white flowers appeared on dresses, skirts, and coats. The leopard section read Italian cougar on a mission and not a good one. While I will say the flowy capes and cape dresses in navy blue and birch were tall tolerable. The sequin section was nice, especially the green dresses worn by Amar Akwe, but the rest of the gown and evening dress section read like a bad Maria Grazia collection, and that really hurts me to have to say. Maybe you're saying I'm being too harsh, but look 88 is all the evidence I need to see. The cups of the dress are disgraceful, the bodice is awful, and the pleating of the skirt is a downright disgrace. Luckily, supermodel Ada Akech completed the finale in a red sequin column turtleneck gown, which reminded me of the Haute Couture collections, so I guess I didn't absolutely hate it. I expect a lot more from Pierpaolo, and to say I was disappointed was an understatement. 
be still my beating Valentino heart. Tom Brown. It was a bit of a zoo with Tom Brown this season, and to start it off, a giraffe strutted down the runway with a cutout coat and pleated skirt in red, white, and blue. And besides the giraffe, there was a whole host of other animal heads wearing striped skirt suits, which included a rhino, a gazelle, an elephant, a horse, and a pig. Then male and female models began to emerge two by two with floppy hat masks that made each wearer look like they had long ears of their own. The first look was a pleated dress with red, white, and blue stripes hidden inside the pleats so that the colors flared out as the models moved, which is always a nice surprise. Then there was a pair of navy blue coats with gray corporate cotton dresses underneath with matching chicken bags, which must be a take on the famous Hector bag by Brown, which is in the shape of his dog, Hector. Plaid took on a whole new style with navy blue and whites sutured all over the coat and adding in the tree and bear patches helped play into the mountainscape style they were going for. Also the fuzzy tailed squirrel bag was especially cute. Quilted puffer coats and skirts with elephants as the cross points were cute. There was a whole range of plaid looks and an animal silhouette embroidered look as well. A gray dress matched with a flashy blue blazer trimmed with gold was quite sweet and who doesn't love an ostrich? Stretch bag, if you know what I mean. Then Tom takes on traditional corporate wear by turning pants into tops and blazers and shirts into skirts, which I applaud, but I also wouldn't say they were the best looking. An amazing designer can take the ridiculous and make it look spectacular, like it was always meant to look like that. While Tom is an amazing designer, this wasn't the strongest transformation from him that I've seen. The rest of the collection were avant-garde takes on classic gray suits with pussy bow blouses, puffer coats, trompe l'oeil cape dresses, animal patches with a walrus bag, which I love, gradient grids, frayed layers, trompe l'oeil suit dresses with stick man throws, a savannah landscape patch coat set, and finally a bolero blazer and dress combo with multi-person snake scarf. It wasn't an insane collection like we're used to with Brown, but between the bags and some of the intellectual takes on suiting, it was a little stunt and I'm happy with it. Next up is Givenchy. And I should just say, since this video was written, Claire White Keller has officially left Givenchy. Anything after Claire White Keller's last ready to wear collection could be declared a triumph because just about anything would be better than the 90s denim monstrosities. So this season, everybody sang her praises for the sole reason that, well, it wasn't last season. She she opened the show with a black turtleneck and wrapped skirt with a floppy black hat as she's probably still trying to capitalize on her extremely well-received couture collection. But the look is a bit fashion nova. A red coat with sculptured sleeves and a red and black ensemble were a bit blah, as were the plaid looks. Two black looks took on quite rectangular sleeves while a draped and pleated number confused the quite simple vision CWK was already having. And if it's a simple vision, it should be a lot harder to confuse, no? The cape dress continued to make appearances throughout multiple collections, with Claire White Keller utilizing a boxy gray style, while she took on color blocking in fur and flowy chiffon. Kaya Gerber stunned in a cropped red poncho with wrapped skirt, before more or less spellbinding plaids took up space. Two disappointing takes on the rugby stripes also showed up, but I won't drag Claire White Keller for it because nobody seems to be able to transform the distinct stripe. Some of the graphic clashing prints looks were nice, like the purple and green, with the interestingly shaped wool belt with asymmetrical skirt, and the purple, white, and brown style too. The other styles in that range weren't too pretty though, as look 26 made the model look like she was wearing a diaper. Another looked like there was an oversized dinner napkin that the model forgot to take off before she got on the runway, and the printed and black ruffle split down the middle dress just wasn't terribly flattering and looked like a sack. Luckily, Claire White Keller knows how to adapt her chic little couture numbers to ready to wear with a tight black poncho dress that should be what most of the collection should look like. The nylon style was blah, the silver skirt looked like Fashion Nova, and the cape dress is fine, but nothing spectacular. The pom-pom skirt hurt my soul. The blue raffia looking top with feathers jumping out was okay, but it was killed by the feather skirt, dress, and top as they weren't anything special or innovative. A red feather coat was nice, but we've seen it from brands like Valentino before, while a white off-the-shoulder gown was sweet. The collection finished with some fringe looks, one being a semi-decent black and white gown with fringe trim around the waist and shoulders, while the next three looks had little dashes of fringe all over, like polka fringe. 
unmatched. Was it good? No, but it was there. The finale dress had an 80s style shoulder in white with black polka fringe and a black feathered floor length skirt, but again, was nothing to write home about. Claire White Keller's Givenchy is a mystery to me. One day it's great, another it's a mess, and then the rest of the week it's just tired, but I guess it will remain a mystery to me because she won't be putting out any more collections. Next up is Alexander McQueen. Sarah Burton's Alexander McQueen is a lot more wearable and demure than the brand's founder Lee, but in recent collections she has stepped up into delivered some of the best tailoring and fashion, which is a house signature. This season looked at Wales and its history, which is nice as many brands draw inspiration from abroad and can be quite culturally appropriative. Lee and Sarah both have taken from the British and Irish Isles in order to deliver new and updated versions of the classics of the lands. The show started with a navy blue jacket that used white lapels and waistband to create shape, while the next look was a dress in a similar vein with a white top and navy blue skirt. But two triangles jumped onto the white, creating what looks like darts, but obviously don't create the same effects whatsoever. A beautiful blown up plaid high-low jacket was ethereal. The fit was dynamic and the way the blown up print accentuated the shoulders and waist was great, as well as having a reversal of the print in the lining, which was visible because the high-low style. I was quite proud of Sarah. There was a simple high-low gown, as well as a draped plaid one-shoulder dress over a leather bustier, which was a bit Celtic warrior princess, but not amazing. There was a lilac draped dress which was disturbing, and it proves that draping is something Burton's team has to work on, as Lee himself wasn't a very good draper till he was the creative director of Givenchy. A plaid coat would have been like all the others, except it had a black motif that looked as if the plaid had been broken like glass into smaller pieces. A black and leather draped dress emerged and didn't do much, but the other broken plaid motif suit was equally as compelling in a fitted suit form. A vestal white cotton high-low gown was dramatic yet chaste, and didn't even let the black leather harness on top make it dirty. And we all know by now, black leather harnesses can be downright mucky. Burton was inspired by historical Welsh quilts, which could be why she showed a collaged patched suit with animal patches. Maybe her and Tom Brown were on the same wavelength. While a simple yet effective lilac dress in a similar style to the white cotton one also emerged. The color blocked leathers in red, black, and purple were strange, but were saved by a simple white cotton dress and a funky printed coat. Two blown up argyle sweaters were quite smart, as traditionally the argyle motif is made up of multiple diamonds, but here Burton used a section of the print where two diamonds would be and used it to again accentuate the shoulders and waist. A striped suit and wool patch dress were tiring, till a double facing embossed silk tailored jacket made me feel much better. Burton continued her use of plus size models, but unfortunately the fact fabric was ill-chosen, and it looked like a bad red carpet moment waiting to happen. There were two sweet little cutout negligee style dresses. They were just very slinky and sexy, which felt very Lee-like, while the quite feminine colors and styling is very Sarah. There were also some severe leather looks decorated with lace, which was actually reminiscent of Welsh love spoons, which are a traditional love symbol that young women would give their suitors. A four-leaf clover print was obviously done digitally, as you can see the pixel isolation of the images, and with the large and in charge silhouettes, it was made evident, but a sweet tailored suit in a sharp red was beautiful. Burden played with gradients brilliantly, as the dress and tailored coat were black and like magic started to become sheer as they passed the thigh. Paloma Elcester appeared in a decaying version of the four-leaf clover dress with visible netting to bolster the volume of it. I would like to say, Sarah, I'd like to see some more suiting next season. While I think it's great to see plus-size models on the runway, I'd like to see a McQueen suit on a plus-size model, as truly it's a house specialty, no? I really think designers ought to revolutionize how we see plus-size women and by creating beautiful suits for them. McQueen could be ahead of the curve. A bolero blazer in red with detached tails was matched by a pink bustier top with tails, and a black and red sleeve blazer gave bloody bat vibes. But I'm down. A silver dripped love spoon dress emerged, but wasn't amazing, while a white net with red lace bouffant gown was chic. Burton finished the dissertation with a glittery black intricate cutout bodice that fell into a black net bouffant skirt and showed when needed, Burton can create a tool-like monstrosity. Sarah Burton develops a nice style this season, but I'm always looking for her to push it, especially with the tailoring. Next up, Yeezy. Kanye West has returned to fashion after two and a half years and staged an impromptu show during Paris Fashion Week, which was headlined by his daughter, North. This is cool. 
His last show from fall 2017 was designed by a very different Kanye than the one we know now. But while the collection wasn't good per se, it didn't mean that there weren't pieces worth mentioning. Especially this fibrous cotton textile that truly is amazing to me. I mean, from the very first look, fabric that looks like torn apart cotton balls was incredibly interesting, as it created an insane texture and a thought-provoking question about what this textile actually is and whether or not it's wearable. And it's pretty nice in pant form. The collection continued in a bit of a lighter earth and neutral tone direction, which felt like a matcha version of the deep and muted tones that were so recognizable for the Yeezy brand years ago. But the idea of the athleisure still holds true for the brand, with puffer crop tops, pastel sweatpants, and even an armband. There were more puffer coats with snoods, and who doesn't love a snood? The wax blue fabric was blah, as were the weird stitch jeans that followed. Violet Beauregard's violet stained tank appeared, and the Augustus glute puffer that appeared after it made me think the Oompa Loompas were going to come out and sing. Three Yeezy Stark daywear looks showed up before we got to see more of the cotton ball texture. A large puffer coat looked full, while the pants that came with it looked a bit patchy. You could obviously see through the model's skin, which didn't necessarily look bad, but just was a different style. The finale look was similar with a jacket with snood hood and less opaque pants. In reality, besides the cotton ball fabric, there wasn't too much to see from the Yeezy show, but I will be the last person to count Kanye West out of the fashion game. He comes, he shows, he gets laughed at, but his vision usually lasts the longest. Next up is Chanel. I am still incredibly bored of Virginie Viard and her Chanel, but now it seems like everybody else has cottoned on to the fact that she isn't ever going to deliver even 10% of the showmanship that Karl Lagerfeld did. Virginie wanted to look back at the brand's history with horses and equestrian dress styles. You know what they do to the horses, people. You know what they do to the horses. Virginie sent two models down the runway to open the show instead of the industry standard, which designers like Marc Jacobs have also done this season, although it's not terribly helpful for those trying to look at individual looks. Me. There was a chartreuse tweed skirt which felt like it was cut with a younger client in mind, with large utilitarian pockets and a zip-up skirt for easier movement. It was paired with a black tweed jacket, with silver armbands, a lace crop top, and button-up 80s cut pants. Neither made you want to look their way, but it took an even worse turn when you looked down at the hideous take on riding boots that were black, but when flipped, showed the lining to be brown. Another yellow tweed look appeared with classic Chanel costume jewelry, with a Byzantine mosaic necklace with a Chanel double C in the middle. Note, I'm spending lots of time on the jewelry, as I'm trying to spend as little time on the clothes as possible. Virginie flipped back and reversed it with two looks in black and white. The first was a top and skirt with scalloped collar, textured black coat, and black sheer Chanel logo tights, while the other look was a white blazer with black lace top and corduroy button-up pants. Honestly, who's wearing the fucking pants? The local third grade basketball coach, who also happens to be a Chanel client? Riddle me this one. Riddle me this one. A trio of models materialized, and they all wore completely different looks, which might be nice in theory, but it's better if the models walking together have at least something in common. It would give the collage of looks more of a well-rounded and in-sync vibe. I don't know how, but she made Kaya Gerber look downright dreadful in that nylon off-the-shoulder dress. No wonder Virginie and Kate Young, Margot Robbie's stylist, get along so well. And please don't come near me with those awful Chanel mosaic belts, or the most boring Chanel bags that I've ever seen. A a hideous knit sweater with gigantic colorful Byzantine mosaic cross was hidden under a color block cardigan and then was paired with awful velvet button-up pants. Let's talk about that sweater though, and I mean, there's no way it isn't a reference to the Christian Lacroix sweater that was famously worn on Anna Wintour's first Vogue cover as editor-in-chief. Then there were two tweed jacket looks. One was a gray cutaway coat whose shoulder should have been a flatter shape on the model. And also, the button-up pants made everything below the thigh anything but flattering. While the green tweed with jewel encrusting felt too boxy when paired with its button-up pants. Did Virginia really just repeat that god-awful sweater and, and think a pair of leather button-up pants was gonna make us feel something? Stripes over graphic knits, plus a white pair of Chanel logo tights, but not paired with a boot that would look nice instead. It's the same shitty, ugly 
Boo. Like, what is happening? The Chanel letter coat is the most reductive thing and means she needs to be replaced immediately. Chanel is the last stronghold of luxury. This is not it, Virginie. Chef pants paired with those boots and a nylon jacket with ridiculous square collar makes me question if I just put all of those things in a sentence. How could someone put them all together in an outfit? Also, Virginie Babes, buttoning from the top and leaving the jacket open isn't as effective as you think it is. The knit gray button up pants would do really well on TikTok. I like the black and white wrap jacket and the fully knit style was cute, except for the boots, which are just nonsensical in this collection. Like also, did we not have the budget to get more than one style of shoe on the runway at Chanel? A crop top and skirt combo really had me asking the question, are we all like, okay? Are we all watching the same fashion show? How can a gray tweed bandeau, Mormon length skirt and bandana tie place not over the bandeau, but under it to highlight the ugly Chanel camellia all be made out of the same fabric? Although the next look utilized the bandana more effectively. Large slitted skirts, some made of sad fringe, were only paired with pink puffer coats and white tight quilted tops. We got a bit of an equestrian style hat, which was matched with Viard's signature striped turtleneck coat dresses. Viard is trying to skew younger with her Chanel, but this crop top lace skirt set style could have achieved that if the lace wasn't so old world boudoir. And what young person wants to put a bandana down their bra? I get stuffing, but that's a bit drastic, no. The tweeds bustiers were god awful, the fit was atrocious, the length was even worse, and that could have been a perfect place to tap into a cool and simple style of tweed bustiers or camis that would easily speak to young people. But again, that was fumbled. Fringe skirt plus white logo tights plus black plus brown boots equals ugly. There was a nice trio of black, which felt like they actually were fitted nicely, which is a sight for sore eyes in the Chanel collection. The black looks that followed were boring, till a black and white dress read early 2000s Chanel and a white tweed hot pantsuit, which was so chic, except obviously for the boots. Also, can the boots not get a color change? The white crop top and black hot pant looks were meh, and I wanted to like the off the shoulder velvet dress, but I wasn't completely sold. The chic white sky scallop looks gave me some hope. They felt extremely elegant and had a minimalistic yet luxurious feel. It's like if the Olsons did Chanel, which would be a dream. Then it went all strange again with a box jacket, feather shoulder pads, and more button up pants with a strict and tight sort of windbreaker. Add out a catch, luckily got the only good looking pair of button up pants in a crisp clean white with bright gold buttons that accentuated the rest of the look. Two Pirate of the Caribbean styles with ruffly white pirate shirts and either black button up pants or a long Mormon skirt made me think Johnny Depp had gotten into basketball, like the rest of the models at Chanel. Who knows, maybe he and Lily Rose Depp practiced shooting hoops together. The finale had three models, including Gigi Hadid, who all emerged wearing white and black monochromatic crop tops, hot pants, and long coats, as well as costume jewelry, boring bags, and those fucking boots. Virginie Viard needs to go back to her old job as head of the atelier, because I can't stand this monstrosity of an aesthetic for much longer. Louis Vuitton. Nicolas Gasquier is, um, well, he's kind of a fucking weirdo. And now he's becoming a repetitive weirdo and I'm incredibly bored of Vuitton. This season especially should have allowed him to get his creative juices really flowing, seeing as he is a co-chair for Louis Vuitton sponsored, but now postponed Met Gala. The theme is about time, fashion and duration, which was an easy inspiration as part of the set was a choir of around 200 wearing historic dress and costume from all different eras and parts of the world. I expect some of that historicism to leak into the collection in a decadent way, but it didn't. The show opened with a graphic vest parka with a little tutu skirt, which felt fine, I guess, because I've become so accustomed to Gusquet's strange stylings for the past few seasons. Also note the handbag, as if you're meant to look at anything at the Vuitton show, it's the accessories. It's a casual keep-all, the status quo Louis Vuitton duffel bag with updated straps. 
I guess Nicola wanted the audience to know that while the Met Gala theme may revolve around fashion and how time affects certain styles relevancy, the Louis Vuitton classics will always be classics. Gasquier continued his sportswear styles with what looked like ski and snowboard jackets, adding leather gloves, which might have a big clientele now, as well as a bag with a new canvas motif. A sheer baby doll tutu style dress with leather moto top underneath and sheer pants was an interesting silhouette as it did remind me of bloomers and there was a similar style but in all leather. There were two more ski jackets, but a group of tutu styles and skirts and baby doll dresses were, I guess, interesting. I particularly liked the one that had the beige bodice and beige green and gold tutu skirt. It's weird, but I've come to appreciate the strange contrast pieces from Gasquier somewhat. There were more of the ski jackets mixed with tutu skirt takes on the moto leather styles in a dress and skirt, but before Gasquier put boring plaids over other boring separates. I personally think the style stylings of these Louis Vuitton shows are the real killers because you'll have one or two styles that could be interesting but the way they're put together is such a turnoff. There were bright leathers which were less than appealing but the leather coats with fur trims made up for it I guess. We got a trio of dowdy patterned dresses before there was a nice navy and white little cardigan set. The glittery hydro dip-like motif had been explored by Gasquier before, namely the Japanese resort collection and something similar from spring 2020. There were a bunch of blazer look, but the only thing I actually cared about was that ruched pant and boiler suit. I care about the pieces separately because looking at the full looks hurts my eyes too much. The collection finished off with a few interesting little bolero jackets that were heavily embroidered and encrusted, and two of the looks had quite nice quilted pants. But in reality, they really were of no consequence consequence. The collection was short for a big house, but let's look at the accessories a bit more, seeing as how they're so vital to the brand. Gasquier on the brand's website mentioned that he wanted to juxtapose classic Louis Vuitton bags like the Petite Mal, Bolt Chapeau, and Dauphin, just to name a few against historic paintings. All in all, Nicola is confusing and strange, but his contract is going to last a while, so we better just get used to it, I guess. That is the end of our Paris fashion review. Thank you for sticking around and watching, and I'm sorry they were late, but they were well worth it, I hope. I love you guys. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video, and TTYL.